As the glory of God increases in our lives, as the glory of God continues to touch us, understand that uh, we not just sing about God's glory and power, but it is always available upon us. And um, so, not a single one year, every time you come to Sunday or any normal service, uh, need to go away with any sickness or any, uh, any ail ailment. As long as you're in the presence of God, the presence of God renew you. Amen. And uh, we are in a different state where the authority and the rule of Jesus Christ in our lives will give life to your physical bodies. And uh, that comes with every situation. And even uh, small, small little things we could help you in. And uh, besides talk, talking about basic Christianity. Like for example, one of the questions that uh, Deborah asks is, you know, we see these visions of her mother walking and all those things. And uh, sometimes uh, on her side, it gets comfortable, you know, uh, as she is uh, uh, sitting and being ministered to and all those things and all that. So I've said that, um, there is a way in which we can bring the vision to pass in God's full timing and, uh, and, and work along with me on this area. And one of those things is that at home, you know, get her to stand once in a while and stand more often. But the other thing is we're going to do is pray about a certain Sunday uh, where, where you would, you know how your faith is released like the woman in Matthew chapter, uh, Mark chapter 5. A certain Sunday, as uh, and and give me the date, and I'll prepare. Everyone will prepare, and said, you know, on that date we get her to stand up in the presence of God to fulfill that vision, so we could gear all our faith towards a particular Sunday. Pray, give me the date, and then we'll get her off, and then get her the cane, and make at least the first few steps towards that. And in the meanwhile, you can do it at home also, and that will bring about a recovery. Uh, in her, and uh, I did answer the question a different way uh, the last Friday, right? And, and uh, last Friday, and uh, I wanted to help each one into the level of faith that they can move in. But as a church, in a very pastoral way, we love and 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 with love and gentleness and care, we can help each one into the fullness of faith and to walk in a level that God wants them to walk in. So we'll do that for your mom and pray together and work. And then on that one Sunday, as the anointing of God flows steadily together with her love for the Lord and her zeal, and then we'll, we'll bring her up and take a few steps. And that will begin that recovery stage to a certain level. All right. So for every one of you else, also for whatever areas and ailments, know that we are at a different stage. We don't just sing that there's a river of God flowing for healing, but uh, that healing is available. And, uh, it's, and every one of you has been anointed uh, in order that you will go forth and bring forth healing, blessing, signs and wonders in your own life, uh, wherever you are. And as I speak, uh, I could even sense right now that there is a um, uh, left shoulder area and I'm seeing a vision as I'm speaking also. It comes from here all the way here uh, in this area on the left shoulder. And uh, so you need not go away with that problem. As you sit in the presence of God, you will sense a healing anointing of God <coughs> flow to you. and. Uh, Receive all the fullness of God's healing in your life. Although it's a regular Sunday and uh, normal teaching, but the presence of God, in the presence of God, is your healing. Praise the Lord. So, uh, we look into basic Christianity, and based on the questions I answer, uh, some of the questions that I have, uh, the notes that you, you wrote last week, uh, one area that I want to cover is on predestination. And uh, we're doing a very simple, basic understanding of it, and also ans uh, answering the question, why predestination? Let's look at the book of uh, Romans, chapter 8, and then Ephesians 1, where the word predestined takes place in the Bible. Romans 8. In Romans 8, Paul talks about our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ and our call unto Him. And this is what I call our common predestination unto Jesus. Our common predestination 
Uh, let's, let me bring out the verse. In verse 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the call according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Obviously, the predestination doctrine is in basic Christianity too. Another place we read is Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And this time Paul takes us further back, further back in him. And it tells us, uh, let's start reading from uh, verse um, 10 onwards. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we first trusted in Christ, should be to the praise of his glory. Also, there's one more right at the top, verse 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by we has made us a scepter in a beloved let's go to God in prayer Father we thank you we thank you for your calling on our lives we thank you for a predestination in our life we ask again for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to pour forth upon all who hear your word this day. Those who are here and those online. That the spirit of wisdom and revelation will come upon every heart and every mind. That a clarity will come and they will see all that you want to show them. Of the beauty of predestination. That they all may enter into the rest that has been brought forth in our Lord Jesus Christ that will establish us in Him. Thank you, Father, that you will reveal to all the riches of your glory, your inheritance in the saints, exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. Thank you, Father, and of all your resurrection power that is in Jesus. Cause us to know Jesus, the fellowship of His sufferings, and the resurrection power. In Jesus' name, and we all say, Amen. Amen. Now, let me draw this little simple chart on predestination to help us understand the basic 101 of predestination. Part of predestination is to actually help us to enter into a rest. Because in life, we have the struggle between free will and predestination. And for nearly 2,000 years of Christianity, there's a debate between what we call uh, Calvinism and uh, Arminism. Uh, and uh, Arminism is like free will. Calvinism is like predestination without free will. So both are, one is, both are very extreme. Uh, Calvinism actually talks about predestination without free will. Where whatever you choose doesn't matter. And that's the extent of John Calvin's writing. Uh, it influenced a lot of Christianity uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, those of you who study theology, such that uh, people like John Bunyan struggle whether he was predestined to be lost or predestined to be saved. And that's the depth of uh, Calvinism. And it leads to what we call double predestination. That means separate predestination for those who are lost and those who are saved. That means you're predestined to be saved, you cannot help but be saved. Predestined to be lost, you cannot help but be lost. 
no matter what you do in life. So that's an extreme Calvinistic view. On the other side is Arminism. Uh, Arminism, uh, I believe, uh, is named because um, uh, it might arise from those regions or whatever, uh, or after a person named in that area, but the history of it is vague. But the main thing is, it is the view that proposed free view. That, uh, and both has its argument. I remember in uh, seminary, and we have that class in seminary, and so uh, on one side, you know, talking about how if God, uh, God have you in His hand, you know, uh, there's, you, you, there's nothing you can do because under God's hand. Then the other side's argument says, well, you can still walk outside the hand. So the question is, can you walk outside the hand? And uh, such was the debate in those days that in the time of John Wesley, uh, in what we call the First Great Awakening, under John Wesley, George Whitfield. John Wesley was a Calvinist, but George Whitfield was an Armenian, an Armenian view. So it's uh, two to totally different views. And um, so people try to combine both together by saying that when you enter the door, uh, it says, you know, come, you know, freely come. And then as you enter, then when you look back at the door, it says you were predestined anyway. So they try various ways to explain it, but uh, none of the explanations satisfy because they leave both doctrine, the doctrine of free will and the doctrine of predestination separate. As long as you leave the two separate and don't link it in some way, like A is A, B is B, oranges are oranges, apples are apple, and you don't relate, to, relate how they relate together, it will still produce confusion. You can study orange all you want to do, study apples in all the different types of apples, and you'll still be confused. Until someone come and classify that these are under the category, category called fruit. And uh, so it says uh, uh, oranges are citrus fruits, <coughs> apples are different, total, different type of fruits, but they are all under the category of fruit. They're definitely not under uh, other types of plants, but they are under fruit trees and they're both trees, so they begin to see the similarity, <coughs> and um, that helps. So we need to take predestination for 101, free will, and join them together. The question is, do you, this is predestination, this is free will. Do you join them equally, <coughs> or do you join them this way, one over the other? Or do you join them this way? <coughs> you have to bring them together <coughs> to see how they relate to one another. Now, we already have some teaching in those areas. <coughs> so we ask the question, this is the first choice, joining. <coughs> this is the Second choice, one over the other. This is the third choice. <coughs> one, two, three. Based on what you have learned, so let me do a survey. Who are those in number one? Put up your hand. No number ones here. Okay. Number two. <coughs> no hands here. Number, yeah, number two. Which means predestination is above free will. Number two, number two, number two, or suddenly got more number two, 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 two. Okay. Number three. A lot got no hands. <laughs> So, obviously the doctrine of predestination has not been absorbed. <laughs> Definitely not been absorbed yet. So, we will help you. Now, why do you say it's two? Let's Petra be the spokesman for you, number two. No matter, no matter what we do, God will still lead us to that area. 
where we want. Okay. There were no number trees. So no number three to defend free will. <laughs> right. Josh Whitfield would have been quite disappointed. Okay. Hey, you're number one, two or three? Uh, Still thinking? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was wondering where smart I like stands. <laughs> right. Okay. Now if it's number three, they will say opposite from Petra. They will say, no matter what God choose, I still can choose. And so, and they both have their scripture. You might quote Paul's life. No matter how he choose, God chose him when he was in his mother's womb. Always before his mother's womb, God had chosen him. But talk about when he came on earth. For his mother's womb, God chose him. And then, he went to go the wrong way, Damascus Road. Remember, he didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose him. On the way to kill more Christians, the Damascus Road experience came. X9. Then, after that, it was a long walk with Jesus. And then, he fell in love with Jesus, and he lived his life for Jesus. You have Paul's life. The Arminis will, they might choose Judas Iscariot. He was one of the twelve. Acts 1 say he has an office. Acts 1 say he was chosen. But he obviously chose his own way. To the extent that the Gospel of John, Jesus says, the devil entered into him. And obviously he's lost and he's in Hades. Jesus also mentioned that he was a son of perdition, his loss. So he chose. Obviously, God did not choose him to be the, on the other road, but uh, he made his choice and went his way. So both seem to have stories and scripture. That's why the debate has been going on for nearly 2,000 years. Because he got enough scriptures, sufficient scriptures. Uh, to argue. But we examine it very carefully. Let's examine. The question is whether two is correct or three is correct. And um, <clears throat> let's just take off hand and ask a little question here, which will help you to identify and point you in the direction. You know how all truths have a common sense and a simplicity to it. And here's the thing. Asking a simple question. Which do you think is more powerful? Predestination or free will? <coughs> All agree? <coughs> Anyone say free will more important, more powerful? Okay, all who say predestination more powerful, is that unanimous? Unanimous decision? Okay, you didn't even have your hand. You're saying the same thing. Okay, <coughs> now, that, that is true and helps you. Because fundamentally, this is how you understand, understand predestination. Predestination is by God. God is behind it. God is the one who designed all things. And whatever he designed, he puts his power behind. Free will is by man. From man's side. And obviously, it cannot match God's predestination. Now, here was the problem. When predestination was taught under John Calvin, it was taught such that free will doesn't play any role. Free will is almost like an illusion. It doesn't affect anything. But that is not the Bible doctrine. If predestination is so powerful, that it completely wipes out free will. You wouldn't have a problem in the judgment day 
of people entering the throne of judgment the, in the believer's judgment in 1 Corinthians 2 without any rewards. Because everyone will fulfill the predestination, correct? But you have in 1 Corinthians 2, some people are saved but zero reward. And it mentioned, you are still judged based on your works. Your works involve your free will. Ah. So obviously, even though God designed predestination, there is a place for free will somewhere. There must be free will. Which means the old doctrine of predestination without free will is wrong. On the other hand, free will being more powerful than God's design doesn't seem possible. Although man has a freedom to choose until they choose hell, they choose the devil, they choose sin, they choose the wrong things. And they have the freedom to choose. But that freedom did not cancel, annul, remove, annihilate the plan of God. Except that you become a player against his plan and God's plan still works. God's plan and predestination could not be stopped. But humans can stop themselves from being part of God's plan. And that is the part we can fit in. So we define free will is a part where even though God has a predestination, the choice is still there to be a part of his plan. Or not. In other words, we are not robots. We can freely choose. God designed a plan for us, but He gave us a free choice. Which, when you combine the two together, the correct one will be predestination is greater than free choice. That's the first 101 point. When you combine like that, it means that free will it's a subset of predestination. You know what subset is? That means it's underneath it. It will mean that you're not, com <clears throat> you're not comparing oranges to apples. You're comparing apples to apple. Under this side is Fuji apple, Royal Gala apple, uh, Pink Lady Apple, uh, Crab Apples, Wild Apples, different type apples. So you're saying this is a subset of this. Can you see it very clearly? And I make it very simple, basic Christianity. So predestination and free will is not comparing apples and oranges. It is comparing apples to subset of apples, different types of apples. And we all know apples can be very different. Have you seen the Fiji apple? Whoa. Have you seen the wild apples? Tiny little fellas. And the size is so different, the taste is so different. It's almost like almost like different species. When you put a wild apple, which is so tiny, with a big giant Fuji apple, they look like two different species. But they are subspecies of apple. Okay, here we are in Asia. There's so many varieties of rice. Japanese rice is sticky rice. And then there is uh, pulut hitam, which is a black rice. And we rarely eat it with food. We re eat it by itself because it has a strong taste by itself as a delicacy and dessert. Then you have uh, basmati rice, which is a light type of rice. And then you have uh, a very long grain rice. 
And most people like the jasmine rice, the Chinese uh, like those because it has a combination of both. A little bit of stickiness, a little bit of lightness, which is different from basmati rice. And if you travel a lot, you realize that in Turkey, the Turkish rice has long grain and a different taste. And uh, then you also have wild rice, which is a bit different. And, uh, uh, and brown rice before they, they have it and then you also have different size of grain when you put different types of rice and take the longest grain rice and put it next to the uh, farmer's rice let's say in East Malaysia in Bakalanglang they grow the rice very tiny little grain very nice to eat the grains are so small and uh, so you put it next to each other, you say, wow, there are so many types of species of rice. This is what a subset means. When you bring two things together, a subset means that that thing explains more of this thing. And uh, it's a subset of different things, like one A, B, C. And so it's a subset underneath it. So <clears throat> we put... Uh, uh, what we call a free wheel is a subset of predestination. So we solve the first problem, which 2,000 years did not solve. We solve it by putting it in a subset. Then we prove how the subset works. How does the subset works? And I make it simple. The subset works, I'll give more scriptures afterwards, by giving you uh, subsets of predestination. I just put as a P, which is A, B, C. Only three subsets. You got three possible choices. Perfect will, <clears throat> permissive will, and outside God's will. That means not in His will, outside His will. So apparently, under God's perfect plan and predestination, you have three possible choices. Classify the three possible choices. And <clears throat> we can show that Judas is carried even before he fell. God, through his foreknowledge, knew that he's, he's leaning towards... See, at the very beginning, you can look at a person and see where they lean. Whether they are leaning closer to A, or they are leaning closer to B, or they are really leaning closer to C. They want to be outside. And by looking at a person's free choice because now free choice when you look at that I have to use more words free will is a limited free will and I can prove it in the natural we were designed to breathe oxygen so when we say you can choose any place in the world to live in and we are also designed such that we need a certain temperature to live comfortably. If you don't have, you've got to produce a temperature by fire or by other means. You cannot live too cold. If too cold, you've got to warm up the place. You cannot live too hot, you've got to cool down. So, even though we have free will, our bodies were not designed to live without oxygen or to live beyond certain temperature. Obviously, uh, if 
a person is right out in the desert, exposed all the time, without any shade, the person will die. And the same way, if a person is exposed in the cold, like sometimes in winter, they find people who are outside, especially the poor people who got no home, they're staying outside, in a freeze, they die. Because the body was not made to live outside of certain temperatures. So talk about free will. It's a limited free will. Which means, you cannot live on the moon. To live on the moon, you must bring oxygen there and bring your whatever environment that is there. You cannot live under the sea, like a fish, because we need air. We cannot take oxygen from the water. So, we have free will to live anywhere we want. Uh, obviously, you're limited to the places that you can breathe oxygen and have a comfortable temperature. Anything outside that, you've got to create an environment which is very expensive and very difficult. So, free will is limited by your very nature and ability. The same way, God cannot design predestination without free will. Because without free will, we will be robots. We will be like the plants who cannot choose. But God has to give free will. But the free will cannot be greater than His ability. Because if it is, then God cannot, God would give too much and not be able to defeat evil. Because although he can, but he is limited, he can't. Once he gives that freedom. So obviously, Satan rebelled. He has some free will. But God prevented his free will from crossing boundaries. Because if God gives free will, say, Oh, you can put your throne anywhere. And Satan said, I'd like to be up there next to you. They say, Okay, it's free will. And Satan climbed up and put his throne. <laughs> Obviously, it cannot. Free will is limited. He said, okay, you, you want your throne? I will give you a time limit. And in your rebellion, you're going to put your throne anywhere within the area. See what you can do. Prove that if you are king, you can produce good things like I produce. And everywhere where Satan is enthroned, he has only produced horror. So God is clever. Prove yourself first. Be faithful to $10 before you be faithful to $1 million. So you give him a $10 territory. He cannot even do well. How can he rule an unlimited territory? Wisdom. So that's predestination. is designed in that, into it. And it must give free choice. But the free choice is limited to three. And no more than three. That makes predestination simple. Free choice or perfect will. Perfect will means you flow exactly in a predestination. Permissive will means you do two things. You are doing God's choice for you, but you add your own things. And, or you take a slightly different route. But it's still within that range. Within a range that God gives you. So that's permissive. And, outside God's will, you still can choose, say, I don't want to do your will. And that one, obviously, you have examples of that. Judas is scared. If Jesus called him to be one of the disciples, it was not just a play acting. He really had a position and he possibly could have made it. So you cannot say he was predestined to be lost. He chose to be lost. He had a tendency to choose to be outside the will. He lived in the boundaries near the outside the will. He was always in the imperfect will. So God protects us. Let me visualize number two for you. 
in another place. Okay. It is like the road that we travel, let me use a different color. I have to make it predestination 101. So from point A to point B, this is the boundary of God's perfect will. Perfect. Perfect will. God always used things like, uh, do not walk to the left or to the right. So, we draw another boundary, and this is permissive. Permissive. And there are two permissive. One where you're walking in the right direction, but you add your own things. <coughs> And uh, uh, to to the equation, and so it might bog you down. That's why Hebrews say when you run the race, give up all the weights. The weights might slow you down. So you add your own things, or you wonder about. And uh, so that is also permissive. Permissive. Then. There is, okay, let me use a gray color. And then there is outside God's will. Now, even outside God's will, there's a boundary. God will not let you go so outside God's will that you will hinder his predestination. So you have a limit. Like Satan rebelled and he straight away got boundaries. God will not allow his rebellion to affect his original plan. So the, even outside God's will, he also puts a limit because he's God. So outside God's will is, you know, completely dark, of course. This is outside God's will. There's a boundary. Most people, most people, only Jesus, Jesus has been the only one who walked this path. The only one. Because when you walk that path, God is well pleased. Remember, God says in his water baptism, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then along the way in his ministry, one time in Gospel of John, Jesus says, you know, uh, talk about, uh, Father glorify thy son. And then a voice answered, you know, I will, I will glorify, I'm well pleased with you. In the Transfiguration, Matthew 17, a cloud came, and then when Peter tried to speak, he says, you know, this is my beloved son, hear him. Obviously, Jesus was pleasing God all the way. Most of us, in general, sins, we were in sin. Now before, when we were baby, you have to start somewhere here. So, the, it says, every man that came into the world, Jesus gave some life. Even those not born to Christian family. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John chapter 1. This is an interesting statement about Jesus. In him was light, in verse 4, and the life was the light of man. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. <coughs> then it says in verse 9, That was the true light, which light gives light to every man. Every man. No exception. He gives some light. They might not know that this light was Jesus. But everyone was given enough conscience and enough light to walk in God's perfect will. You have to grow that light. So, it is God's will also uh, in First Corinthians, uh, First Timothy. As Paul prayed, he says in First Timothy two, 
and he desired that all men pray and uh, lifting up their hands and then he says he exhort intercessions and to pray for all that in authority and verse 3 this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be safe which removes the extreme doctrine that God chose some men to be lost cannot because based on John chapter 1 and 1 Timothy 2 John chapter 1 says every man got some light 1 Timothy 2 every man is to be safe so nobody was chosen to be lost and that means the picture should be everyone starts somewhere here as a baby and somehow we wondered about eh, oh nicely oh 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 into sin then you repent born again uh, and after born again uh, we're up here then you like to do your own thing uh, here and there hopefully when you die you're still within this boundary <laughs> most of our life is like that no? goyang goyang you know? <laughs> Uh, we're, we're, we never walk in a straight line we just wander in and out then we get uh, we could be here then we get discouraged uh. then sometimes you know you got tempted Christian life very hard ah yeah non-Christian better oh suddenly you realize you thought it's better worse and then uh, then you go up there again you know you repent most of our lives are like that but notice you only got three choices perfect will the red line permissive will the blue line and outside God's will the gray line that is there so Paul obviously came under here if Paul had died before Jesus revealed himself he would be lost he himself said he was lost he knew he was lost but God pulled him back and the reason God pulled him back and here's the thing you don't look at a person's life outside God has never judged a person based on just the works it looked like it but not just the works in 1st Corinthians chapter 2 1st Corinthians chapter 2 See, the reason for predestination, we'll, we'll bring it to a conclusion afterwards, is so that we understand our God. If you understand predestination, you also understand how to get maximum reward. So you may ask the question, Pastor, why should I understand the doctrine of predestination? Because the doctrine of predestination will teach you how to maximize rewards in heaven that's first area because you understand how God sees things God doesn't see as men see so in the judgment day Paul says in 1st Corinthians oh did I say 2 okay okay <clears throat> take it one more chapter chapter 3 1st Corinthians 3 it says here no foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ now if anyone builds on this foundation with <coughs> gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble each one's work will become clear in that day for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test each one's work of what sort it is notice what sort of work there's a lot of work what sort of work if anyone's work which he has built on it endures endure the fire he shall receive a reward if anyone's work is burned, he suffer loss. But 
he himself will be safe. See that? He's safe. So that person is safe. He only lost his reward. Why did he lose his reward? Which is very important for you to understand. God is not just interested in what you do. Although doing is important. When he spoke the Sermon on the Mount, he ended with the wise man built his house upon a rock. The foolish man built his house on the sand. The floods came up and the rains came down. And the house on the rock stood still. Floods came up and the rains came down. The house on the sand came down. Yes. Yes. Uh, ah, it refers back to the works. Yes, the person still safe. Safe through fire. <laughs> That's what I mean. Safe through a double emphasis. Safe through fire. So God is not just interested in what you do. If you what Paul said, on what foundation? Because both the wise man and the foolish man has a house. Correct? If the floods didn't come, if the rains didn't come, both houses look the same. <laughs> they look comfortable. They might furnish it the same way. But underneath the house is the difference. Underneath the house is different. One can stand the flood, one cannot. In a way, like saying one can stand the fire, one cannot. It was what was underneath the house that made the difference. So, whatever works we do, what is underneath the works? And what is underneath the works? What is the cause of the work? God is interested in why you do something and not just what you do. Your motivation. Your motivation. So now you know why predestination is important. Because it helps you to see the things of God's point. If you see things on the human point, you might have a lot of works. But none of them have a good foundation. You might have lived all your life in vain. And there was one man who lived that way with very little reward. But outwardly he seemed so rewarded. You know who that man is? That man was a man who wrote one of the books of the Bible, or two of the books of the Bible. Solomon. Yes. And one of the books of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. And the most famous phrase throughout the book is Vanity of vanities, all is vain. This is by the richest man in his generation. Gold was so much that silver was counted like nothing. Which generation had that? In every generation, silver still was some value. In his generation, there was so much gold that we don't want silver anymore. Silver was nothing. He had, and talking about pleasure or anything, he had 1,000 wives and concubines. He had horses. He could do anything he want. But this man said, vanity of vanity. That is why no one who has visited heaven today in our modern time has ever been asked to learn something from Solomon. Although he's safe. Because everything he had, he did not 
do it the way David did. His heart, he was only at the beginning part was good. But everything he added to his life keep pulling him down. Don't be like Solomon. Don't make the book of Ecclesiastes your theme. And in the end, you know, he only came to one thing about life. Just enjoy life and, you know, know God as your creator. <gasps> Correct? At the end of Ecclesiastes, just enjoy your life, know God as your creator. I don't want to know God as my creator. I want to know God as my father. His relationship with God was different. Sometimes the Bible is written to tell you what not to be. And so he missed out on life. He lived 70 years. Where is his reward? The only great thing he did was Bigos Temple. But the credit of building the temple was given to King David. Because King David was the one who had the plans, the desire, the zeal, and the money to build it. He only didn't build it because God said, don't build it, pass it on to predestination, the next person. So let me tell you, predestination, he was predestined to build God's temple. And he fulfilled the predestination. But he didn't live for God. Do you know from the very beginning, he started plotting politically. He married an Egyptian princess very early. And he started doing all those things in the natural. He only sought God in the early days. But he forsook God most of his life. Vanity of vanities. The question is, Paul said there is no other foundation but Jesus Christ. It is not so much what you do. Why you do it and why you want to do it is more important. Can you imagine if you don't ask that question right now, you'll be wasting another 10 years. Don't make your Christian life so busy without realizing why you want to do something. Okay. What is the foundation? I know it's right there, Jesus Christ. But what is the foundation? First love. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, Chapter 13. Don't forget, this is the same letter we talk about judgment, foundation, and he says, 1 Corinthians 13. You can have all the gifts of the Spirit, operate in them, prophecy, healing, everything, but if you don't have love, that if you don't have love, you're nothing. Your nothing means when you go to heaven, you're still nothing. You might be predestined to be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But if you didn't operate the ministries out of love, you're nothing. Predestination doesn't reward you. Your free choice in why you do it rewards you. Then he says <clears throat> in verse 3, you can give all your goods to feed the poor, even your body to be burned. Wow, that one is martyrdom. But I have not love. It profits me nothing. Obviously, if you sell everything you have and give away, somebody did profit. <clears throat> the one who received it. But you yourself got nothing. That's the saddest thing. Normally, it's given, it shall be given to you. But... The motivation was wrong. So there was no profit. 
because the foundation was wood, hay, stubble. Things that were not built on love. Remember what Jesus said to the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2. <coughs> he says, they were doing a lot of things. They become traditional Christians because they had a lot of good habits. And it says, in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil, so they are not evil. And you tested those who are apostles and they are not, and found them liars, so you know false apostles from true apostles. And you have persevered, you have patience, you have labored, you have not become weary. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you. Huh. You have left your first love. Repent therefore from where you have fallen. Remember therefore where you have fallen. Repent. Do the first works. Or else I will come and remove your lampstand. I will take away the opportunity you have to shine for me. They lost their first love. So predestination was designed to help us understand you do have free choice. But the free choice is that you would have the freedom to discover that God's way is the best and the way to do it well is to have do it with the same love that God has in you, for you, and through you, the love of God. So we come to that picture and realize <clears throat> the only way to maintain in the red line, when we say you stray away, sometimes before you reach this point, everyone thinks you're here, but your heart was here. Only God knows. We must all constantly bring our heart back to God. So like that old song that said, That's all. Keep first love. Now you know why I always emphasize on first love. Because if you keep doing what you're doing, you don't have first love. And the thing about first love is, we need reminders. We always need reminders. We need to remind her that love is the most important thing, not works. Love. Love. You must have love. Deep love. Sometimes you have deep love and you're not doing anything yet. That deep love will lead you to do the right thing. So we must always keep having love for God, first love. That's the only way that we can be 
in that right place and not wander off. Because Jesus said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. And where, he actually says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So, and you look at that verse very carefully, it's from the uh, Beatitudes and um, Matthew, of course. And what a lovely place that he says that <clears throat> when he talk about the treasures in heaven, lay not for chapter 6, uh, verse 21. Where your treasure is, your heart will also follow. So what's your greatest treasure? If your greatest treasure is Jesus, is Jesus the most important person in your life? First John tells us differently. Little children, do not have idolatry. In other words, do not put any person or thing or idols in front between you and God. God must be first. God must be number one. He must be our treasure. Only when He is our treasure can we be in His perfect will. Can we be in His perfect will? Now you know why Predestination 101 is important. It reminds you to look at things from God's side. Because this life takes a lot of distraction and attention. The same chapter, Matthew 6, later talk about the distractions of this life. The things of this life that people worry about. Food, clothing, shelter, money, leisure, comfort. But it is better to have nothing but have a lot of love for Jesus. Between having 10 houses or luxurious house and having no house but just a coconut leaf above you, but you have deep further for Jesus, choose the coconut leaf first. <laughs> then later, Matthew 6.33 work, you will own the coconut tree, then you own the whole plantation, you build your house there. Always choose that Jesus be your treasure, your greatest treasure. And you can love your spouse, love your family, love your father, mother, love your brother, sister, love, love everyone. But no one takes the place of the throne in your heart but Jesus. That's what predestination will lead us. When you choose Jesus, and that's why in every passage of predestination, he talks about, you know what predestination actually is? The discovery of how much God loves you. Because how can you love God unless God loves you first? Correct? The Bible says that in 1 John, we love Him because He first loved us. So, so your discovery is in two stages. You discover that, okay, Jesus has to be our greatest treasure. We have to love God. And then you struggle to love God. You struggle to put God number one. You struggle to always think about Him. Then the answer to the second struggle comes. See, He already separates you from others. You want to love God. And then he shows you how much he loves you. Then you fall deeper in love with him. We naturally love those who love us. And God loved us first while we were yet sinners. Look at both passages on predestination that I read to you in Romans 8. In Romans 8 that we read just now. <clears throat> It tells us <clears throat> in verse 30, Moreover, 
whom he predestined, this he also called. And then verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. But it is first mentioned in verse 28. We know all things work together for good to those who love God. See, it's, uh, it's built on the foundation of loving God. And then when he talks about predestination, he always talks about how much God loves us, not how much we love Him. He says, from that passage, he asks a question. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, Deliver him for us all. How shall he not freely give us all things? In the end, he was trying to show how much God loved us. And then he said, he was 35, Who shall separate us from the love of God? So he shows how much God loved us. Then when you see how much God loved you, the only response is, I love you too. <laughs> There's at least some response. In the end, unconditional love from God wins. That's predestination. Even in Ephesians chapter 1, the passage that I read, and the other place where predestination is mentioned, it says, Just as He chose us in verse 4, in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, to become His sons. Predestination is to become like Jesus, Romans 8, correct? Predestined to be like Him. Here again, predestined to be sons. Look at what predestination is about. Predestination is to discover God as your Papa. Those who don't have predestination, they see God as a Creator. Vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. Just enjoy this life and know that God created it. He hasn't discovered God as his papa. To be sons. You were predestined to be sons. Correct? It says in Romans 8 and it says here. So what is the whole basis of predestination? That you discover he didn't just create you. He loved you as much as He loved Jesus. Jesus is the only begotten in the bosom of the Father. The discovery is, yes, you are a created being. Yes, you are given free choice. Yes, you are given gifting. Yes, you are given this life. Yes, you are given different things. But with all those things, the greatest discovery is, you are my Father. Although it might be so shocking to some people, you know, you know, almost like when Dark Vader says to Luke Skywalker, I'm your father. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Dark Vader was a bad guy. <laughs> but to discover that the wonderful creator of this universe his majesty and yet he loves you so tenderly like your father and he, pre he wants you to be his son and daughter that's, that's what Peter said to discover he wants you to be son and daughter that's the beauty of predestination seeing it from his side every time the parents were no more than the children. How much more our Heavenly Father? And children only learn to discover themselves. Right? If anyone of you have family or you've, you've brought up children before, they will go through a phase where they don't appreciate the love. They don't appreciate what you have done. And they don't appreciate the sacrifice you have, you have done. Not all children go through that, but most. And then they will reach a point, as they mature, they realize how much it costs to love them. And what it means to love. 
Because when they themselves have to love their own children, they will know, know the sacrifice. Then the appreciation comes. And then finally they say, I love you too. And it's always there in every movie. Well, always, always, always. And there was one, one touching story in Real Digest, which is a true story, of how this person was in an arranged marriage. And he never loved his wife. But the wife was very patient and all those things. Until, always, he was always abusive to the wife. Never appreciative. Took her for granted. And then she did all the things a good wife would do, cook, do all those daily things. And he would just, you know, do the normal breadwinner's job, but he never, never appreciate or love her. Until one day, when he had an eye operation and he needed something to replace his eye. So they somehow got him to the operation and he came back and he could see. When he came back, he saw his wife sacrifice the eye. He saw the bandages around her. He knew she was the one who gave so that he could see. He fell down on his knees and beg her forgiveness and vow to love her the rest of his life. Good story? True story. Unconditional love. And this whole story of this whole creation, the question of why we are here, which is the basic question of human, you know, we are interested. Why are we here? To discover the Father to discover His love, to discover our God, to discover our Maker. That He is not just our Maker. He is the one who loves us more than anything on earth. Every created thing. That is a value of predestination. Amen. Now, we need to add one more point to our understanding on that. We ask questions like, okay, here, there is a predestination of Cyrus and what he will do even before he was born by Isaiah. And he was named in Isaiah uh, chapter 44. In his prophecy about how the Israelites will enter into captivity, Babylon, and how they will come back again, there's a prophecy that says in verse 28, and this is at least, according to scholars, at least 400 years before it occurred, who says, Who says of Cyrus is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built. To the temple your foundation shall be set, shall be laid. Then verse 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him. Good prophecies about how Cyrus will bring the people back to the temple. He is not the only one. Scholars, many, some scholars cannot believe that God can predict something 400 years before it happened. And so they divided, I remember in seminary, they divided Isaiah to be Isaiah 1, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 3, thinking that a different uh, prophet was writing those things nearer and there was such a king. It's through their unbelief they had to explain things like that. But um, if they read the Bible carefully, God, this is something quite common that God did. In um, 1 Kings 13 verse 2, Hundreds of years before Josiah was born, or even existed, during the first division of the kingdom of Israel into two, northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was given to Jeroboam. The southern kingdom was inherited by Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And in the northern kingdom, the king did a wrong thing. He did a bad thing. Even though God gave him the kingdom, he go and build an altar to worship false gods. And so a prophet came 
in 13 verse 1. A man of God came from Judah to battle by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now remember, this is freshly built altar. Josiah, who is to come, is probably several hundred years later, not even born yet. And the prophet said, Oh, oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David, and on, ye, on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places, who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. He even pronounced the name of a child before the child was born hundreds of years. So Cyrus was not the only one. My question is to you, does Josiah and Cyrus have free choice? Yes, the free choice, even though they are named in the prophecy. They have free choice. Okay, tell me what their free choice is. Start with smart likes. Uh, let's, give, let's give him a microphone, yes. Okay, so those online can see. Yes, start with smart likes. Yes, is it on? Okay. Yep, you're on. Three choices, uh, perfect, uh, Very good. Also, uh, out of the will of God. Uh. Okay. But but I think um, they would uh, these people they would be quite similar to uh, John the Baptist because John the Baptist was also predestined. Yeah. When he was uh, in his mother's <coughs> womb, he leaped when uh, his mother Elizabeth uh, came across uh, Mary, and the child in her womb uh, leaped. So I think uh, the, the, the spirit was also was already very strong uh, in John the Baptist's life, even when he was in the mother's womb. So, but still got free choice. Yeah, but the, the, the chances of him going in a different direction, I think, uh, would, would, uh, be, would not be so great because of the, the spirit, spirit on him, on him uh, right from the beginning. So I think it will be similar for uh, Josiah, Josiah and, Cyrus. and Cyrus. Remember, Cyrus is a completely non-Jew. And God has to raise him up. So, got free choice. Same free choice, ABC. Perfect will, permissive will. And uh, not, not God's will. Outside God's will. Hypothetical case. What happens if they choose not to do God's will? What happened to the word that is there? The word. Maybe God will raise another person by the name of Josiah. <laughs> Good answer. I was waiting for that answer. Thank you very much. That is exactly what will happen. That God will still raise somebody and that somebody will have that name. There might be five Josiahs before the right Josiah will do God's will. And human being human, if you choose, let's say, five, in the end, one will show follow. The direction because God also knows how human free choice works same with Cyrus there might be several king named Cyrus and there will be one that fulfill the prophecy that is there so you can see that human free choice is still given to the most chosen the most chosen means one who is named and your work is spelled out for you. But you still have free choice. What you are to do. Now, let me give you another hypothetical case from Daniel. Because I want you to start applying this to understand that the law works in all situations. To the name and to the unnamed. In the book of Daniel, and... Um, Daniel has some interesting prophecies. And among his prophecies about the kingdoms that are going to come, no human beings are mentioned, but he mentioned empires will come and go. But specifically, as he mentions all the different empires, and then in chapter 8, the ram and the goat, the ram, he zoomed down to two empires, the Middle Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire, which is again interpreted uh, by the angels for him. Now this is the Greek Empire, and it says, Therefore the male goat grew very great, 
But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And then later, the little horn, which is again the Antichrist. And um, Gabriel, the angel, interpreted for him. The ram which you saw with the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise. It happened exactly as in history. Alexander the Great died in his prime and his many generals fought, 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 and then he ended up with four, four sections. So he tried to become more than four sections, but he ended up exactly as the Bible. My question. That this is a prediction that Alexander the Great will not live a long life. It tells you what he will do, and it also tells you that he will die. Question, does he have a free choice? The length of his life. Wow, this is another tough one. The names I give to you and you say, okay, you know somebody by the name. Now, here's another problem I throw. Does he have a free choice how long to live? No. no. <laughs> Regina is laughing. No free choice. Huh? <laughs> what happened if he loved his father and mother? <laughs> and he says, whoever loved your father and mother shall have long life. <laughs> No choice, sir. Huh? You have free choice. Just to have some free choice, otherwise it doesn't violate God's principle that you have free choice. So he still has free choice. Okay, he has free choice. What is his free choice? Okay, can you can you take the microphone? Okay, he has free choice according to Jehuda. So what is his free choice? Whether he wants to conquer or not. That's the choice he has. That means. If he chooses to be the conqueror, because no names are given, then whoever takes that role must accept that with the conqueror thing, also short life. To have long life, don't be the conqueror. That's it. Good answer. There is still an element of free choice. Now remember, that his father Philip could have been the conqueror. In this case, it never named the king. It just named the Greek Empire. If you read Macedonian history, his father actually was the one who united all the tribes. And his father already conquered quite a lot. In fact, when Alexander the Great took over, he depended on Philip's generals. To continue the army in a fight. I, I read, I, I read through the history because I was interested and I keep asking the question, does he have a choice? So the answer came the same way. He has a choice but the destiny that whoever choose that role. Shakespeare says, wow suddenly preaching quote Shakespeare, <laughs> okay. The world is a stage in which all of us are actors. God has already designed certain place and tell you at once what it will be. And that's where I bring you to understand the third point about predestination. Say, wow, there was a third point. Oh, yes. It is this third point. Let me finish this illustration. Done. And here's the one. Okay, here's the third point that we're getting at. Predestination of events is different with people. Can you see that? An event must happen. There are certain play that God says, this must play out. Because the rubber band theory, that when you stretch this way, this one must come back. 
This must play out. But he might not specify who plays the act. In other words, the play is written. There are cert this world is a stage. Certain plays are already written by prophecy. But the actors are not named. Sometimes the actors are named and the part they play is mentioned. Cyrus, John the Baptist. Remember, John was named before, even uh, at the time when, when his wife, uh, when they're about to have a baby, according to Ze uh, Zacharias. And then there was Josiah. And then others who we do not know the full story, like Jeremiah, say Jeremiah chapter 1, before I was in a womb, God chose me and knew me. So obviously, predestination is working. Uh, David in Psalms 139, all this will be considered in the second service. But uh, to understand more. Now, we teach in such a way that even if you have the first part of predestination, it really got the basic. The second part is more Q&A to understand how this applies. But here, the third point is important. To understand predestination, you must divide between predestination of events and people. Sometimes it involves people and events. The people, because God is a God of order and law, must be given free choice. And they can choose. But the predestination of events must always go ahead. Like, it is God's perfect will for the Israelites to go into the promised land. It's God's perfect will. But the first generation failed. And there was a delay. There was a delay. 40 years in the wilderness, correct? 40 long years in the wilderness. So, what you have is a delay in fulfilling a prophecy. That delay explains why when God says, you know, that they will come out at a certain time and things play out, some put 400, some put 430, and we explain it when it's hidden within the lifespan of uh, Ishmael and, and Isaac. But the other thing is the delay thing. God says, after 400 years, I'll bring them into this land. Delayed by 40 years. Delayed by 40 years. And still God fulfills his prophecy. So apparently, something can be delayed by free will, but not prevented. So predestination of events and people are different. So that's why we give Alexander the Great example. The event that the Babylonian kingdom will be conquered by the Middle Persian must take place. The Middle Persian will be conquered by the Greek, and the Greek will be conquered by the Romans after it divided into four, four kingdoms, uh, four sections. The events are already staged. The angels will keep pushing it. Now, free will is being, being pushed back when it wants to affect the event. Either in the wrong time, wrong place, and the angels will do that. Look at the book of Daniel. Daniel... And you have um, Daniel between chapter 11 and chapter 12. And, um, okay, it would be the one in chapter 11, yes. When Gabriel was manifesting and talking to Daniel, uh, in his, when Daniel was fasting, there was a resistance. But there are certain things that Gabriel said in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 onwards. In the first year of Darius the Mede, 
I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Do you notice that? This is Gabriel talking. So, Gabriel, the archangel, was strengthening the meats and confirming him to be the ruler, the iris. So, archangels are involved in raising a king. An empire. And now I will tell you the truth, says Gabriel. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. So he even know the timing of it. And the fourth shall be richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. It hasn't taken place yet. As he talked to Daniel, there's only the first king. He already know there are going to be three more kings. He also knew that there will be the fourth king who will be so rich that he will cause the people of Greece to come against him. And he says, Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with dominion and do according to his will. See the word his will yet. He's allowed to do his will. When he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Talk about Alexander the Great again. So, then after he mentioned all these things that is there, he says he's strengthening him and uh, uh, he's going, doing all those interesting things uh, on that. But when you check on, okay, here's where I can highlight it. Let me good that it's worse. And it highlights. And within the book of Daniel itself, it says here <clears throat> in chapter um, 10, verse 20, one verse before. Gabriel said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now. I must return to fight with the Prince of Persia. Now, this Prince of Persia is a different one, the one that prevents him from coming home to Daniel. There is an archangel, fallen angel. Fallen angels are trying to make the play mess up the play. But the angels are making sure it follow according to God's writing. And then he says, When I have gone forth, indeed the Prince of Greece will come. So what's, he's doing all these uh, angels are watching, nations rise, nations come. Sometimes they got to push back when it's not time for them to rise. Sometimes they got to encourage them, strengthen them. Sometimes they got to push back. Because humans are human, we got our free will. We need to do things. So sometimes God push you back, sometimes God bring you near. This is a mystery of predestination, of events. Which means that when, an e when, when it's not time for an event to take place, no matter how hard you try, it cannot come. You'll be fighting against God and His angels. However, when is the predestination time for an event to take place, however hard you fight against it, you cannot stop the event lest you be fighting against God and His archangels. And that's why this end time move is important. We know certain things are predestined. We have already given you the seven thunders prophecy and the detail. There are events that cannot be stopped. And then when we as individuals choose to play our role, angels strengthen you. Or to go against those roles, angels, in the, using the sound statement, persecute you. So, wow, angels can persecute one. Persecution for man is nothing. You fear the persecution of angels. 
Say, why do they do that? To guard the chosen and the event. All of you are chosen. All of you are predestined. Oh, I spelled it wrongly. Okay. Let's see whether this translation brings it out. Uh, it is in the book of Psalms. And, uh, okay. It would be inside. <coughs> I remember it's one of my meditation files. It was not against David. And uh, it's not just persecution. Well, it could be the old King James translation. And, um, okay, I got the other way to find out. Angels. Let me highlight angels. And it's in the book of Psalms. Now it's either plural or not. Let's get Psalms. Job and Psalms. Okay. Psalms. They have angels. Sending angels of destruction against angels. Bless the angel. Two more results. Uh, makes his angel spirit and. Uh, Okay, let's see this, let me see. This is God saying, He cast on them the fierceness of His wrath, anger, sending angels of destruction among them. He made a path for His anger, did not spare their soul in death. Okay, I believe the Old King James translation would have been different. Let's tap on this. Oh, I got the. I need to. I was going to spell angels in singular. G E L. Yes, the Book of Psalms again. Give you another verse. Oh, let me go down further to here. Yep, jump forward. Angel the Lord, here he is. This is the West. Let them be chaff before the wind. Let the angel of the Lord chase them. Translated chase in this translation. Let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit. And um, the word pursue, you look at the cross-reference, the Old King James translate it as persecute. Persecute. Persecute is like prosecute, except uh, here the meaning is more like, it's in God's court, the angels are the executors. In God's court, when He determines certain events, those who go against those events, you want to bring it to fulfill too fast, angels will push you down. When it's time for the event to take place and you go against the event, angels will persecute you, chase you. Look, they're chasing. Have you heard of angels chasing people? Chase you. But the correct translation, persecute you. So, uh, hunt, they will hunt you down. <laughs> that sounds like persecution. Because when people persecute, and uh, we get persecution from the world, some are just general. They just say bad things. Some hunt like a sniper. God protects you from all things. The most important place to be is to be in the perfect will of God. When you're in God's perfect will, and you fulfill God's destiny, angels will protect you. You don't even have to worry about protecting yourself. Like Paul says in predestination, who can be against you? Fulfill your role and predestination. This is the real drama, not Shakespeare's drama. Be in the drama 
not that written by William Shakespeare. Be in the drama written by God, which is real life and a true story. Fulfill thy destiny. And that's where you discover your story in his story. And you rise to the place of God's perfect way in your life. So there will always be human players in all events. And in some events, God will mark a chosen person. There might be five Cyruses, five Joshua, Josh, Josiah. And he picks one to take that role. As you take that role, angels, they are assigned for that, come. To make sure that the drama must flow this way. Think about the drama that came after Alexander the Great died. All the powerful generals were fighting. And you read the history. It looks like it's going to be like 10 kingdoms. But the Bible says only four. So there will be probably four angels assigned to strengthen four that God chose to be the dominant ones, to fulfill the prophecy. Not necessarily because they're good people, but at least they have reasonable uh, fulfillment of the quality God needs to make that drama come to pass. And it's a big drama. They make it into four kingdoms before the Roman Empire arose. Interesting. That God has written a play greater than Shakespeare, of which we are all called and predestined. The joy of it is to get into the play, you have already applied and been accepted when you were born. When you were born on this earth, you're already part of it. The key is to discover which part you are and fulfill it with first love for God. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you continue to establish us in that. We know that in this play, in Isaiah 60, even the weakest one of us will be a ruler of nations. So we know, Father, everyone has a great predestination in this end time. It's wonderful to be part of this end time. We ask, oh God, that you continue to establish us in you and cause us to know the fullness of your perfect will. Let your will be done, your kingdom come. Let it be as on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise together. Seal this understanding in each heart and life. I'm sure, Father, you hear our breath and our heartbeat. And let each heart have a heartbeat of first love. You see what man cannot see. You hear what man cannot hear. Our inner thoughts and inner life. And you alone can draw first love from us to do your will. And let it be done in each life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.